call it the Pantera riff. And then we got to the end of Tombstone and we knew that we wanted to like throw like the final nail in the coffin. So we put the movie line in there and then it just drops into that closed hi hat riff, which is like super different for us. It's, it's a good uh, it's a good representation of what I wanted the heavy side of the album to feel like. <laughs> What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Talk To Me right here on NotFest.com. As always, I am Joshua Toomey, and the guest this week is Cody Quistad of Wage War. We dive into his work with Jelly Roll, Ronnie Radke, The Ghost Inside, and even country artist Lakeview. Cody and I dive into his musical past, what got him into music, the first riffs he ever learned, and the early days of Wage War, the new Wage War record. Stigma out now. Make sure you're checking it out wherever you get your music. And you know we got to hit on that Tombstone riff. You know the riff. So make sure you are subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And check out Talk To Me bi-weekly here on NotFest YouTube. And got to give a huge shout out to Matty Mullins of Memphis May Fire for letting me use his studio for this interview. And a Matty Mullins interview coming in the future. Make sure to rate, review, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast, and make sure to leave a comment below. So let's dive into my conversation with Cody Quistad. All right, guys, let's welcome Cody Quistad of Wage War to the Talk To Me podcast here at NotFest.com and in the wise words of Dr. Dre. And when your album sales weren't doing so good, who's the doctor they told you to go see? <laughs> As, uh, is how I feel about you, man, because every time I open up a press release from a, from a band, Mm -hmm. it's always oh yeah and they worked with cody from wage war on these two songs <laughs> it's like dude you were just everywhere man yeah man it's been uh it's been an exciting season yeah. um kind of like it happened out of nowhere I, I say it happened out of nowhere i've been working on it for a long time but uh it really just kind of started picking up um but yeah i've been um been honored to be a lot of uh part of a lot of cool stuff lately for sure when an artist comes to you and says hey we would like to work with you on these songs do you listen to what they're doing and kind of kind of lean into them, or are you like, hey, why don't we try this? Like, what what's kind of your process there? Um, it's kind of a like a mix of both. Um, I feel like when most people, uh, you know, when when people want to work with you, it's because they like something that you do, whether it yeah. be like a style or a, um, you know, a production style or riffing or vocals or what whatever facet I'm uh, being utilized in per project, but. Uh, I think what I like to do is um, like fully take on like, you know, the band It's like, all right, cool. Like, let me get a feel for the band. If I'm familiar, if I'm not, I'd be like, OK, what's this band do? Like, what what do we have in the wheelhouse? And then I start there and then kind of try to like put do what I would do, but through that lens. Right. Um, and yeah, just make sure it's authentic to them. I never want to like make bands feel like I'm like trying to turn them into like wait, <laughs> little wage wars. You know what I mean? Like, I, I always want to keep integrity of what the band is doing the band is doing but i definitely uh i just as as with anything i just have a style and i feel like it kind of comes through quite a you know quite a bit what kind of opened that up for you was was there a, a moment when you started working with other bands yeah so my first i'm gonna call it like i'm gonna call it a big break um this is before wage war was anything um we're from the same hometown as a data member nice. um and coming up um you know they were kind of like um, kind of took us under their wing a little bit and would, uh, you know, f I think just through small town and hangs and stuff, like people would be like, oh, there's this new band. We were had a different name at the time, but they're like, you got to check them out or whatever. Um, and so I think our music got into some of their ears and um, developed some form of relationship. And I remember I was like probably freshly out of high school. Like I said, Wage War is not a thing at this point, but Jeremy called me. Um, and I was like, oh, I like I was on loan number at the time, but it was like, Hey Cody, this is Jeremy uh, uh, from Day to Remember. Like, give me a call back, and I was like, oh, you know what I mean, like hometown hero, oh, like yeah, yeah. so sick. Um, and so yeah, I uh, they pulled me in to work on some songs for Common Courtesy, um, which was sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nails, a song that I did. So that was my first like, you know, label like bands like big like big big time thing uh, for me. And then you know, Wage War started doing uh what wage wars was doing and then kind of along the way um ronnie from falling in reverse uh hit me up um with like the first iteration of i think we did drugs first okay um and then so that 
that was another huge one for me. Uh, and then obviously Corey Taylor was on that, which was another just like Corey Taylor's, you know, singing over my <laughs> guitar parts. Uh, and then came Popular Monster, which has like really been the thing that has like changed everything for me. Um, that song is obviously just like I feel like it's one of the biggest songs in rock, you know, it, at least in the last decade, if, if not, you know, multiple decades. Um so yeah, I mean that was kind of the tipping point of like being being a part of that song. Um, that really changed my life in uh, in the writing aspect. Um, and Ronnie's had me on pretty much every song since then. Um, he'll um, he'll hit me up for some of like the heavier riffy stuff. So um, very very thankful to him and uh, him pulling me in for stuff like that. And then it's kind of just kept going. I've kept working with the Data Member as well, and they've you know kept giving me awesome opportunities. Um, I did some stuff for the Ghost Inside on their last record. Um, trying to think, there's a quite a long long list. I can, it's my best <laughs> friend lives right across the road, and I can hear his truck starting up. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we it kind of so. yeah, we are in Tennessee. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's been crazy. There, I I feel bad. I feel like just on the spot, I'm leaving out some important people, but. Um, that I feel like a day to remember in Falling in Reverse were, were really big for me. How did Falling in Reverse or how did Ronnie learn that you were a songwriter? Uh, Stitch, which was our uh, single off of our second record. Um, we're under the same management together, okay. um, or at least the same management umbrella. We have different managers within, but um, yeah, I think for the story that I've heard is uh, we were. I think it was Warp Tour 2018 or something, and I think he had heard us playing Stitch or something, and I think he asked someone in his management like, "Who who wrote this?" Uh, and he was like, "Well, funny enough, like this is someone that's on under our same like management umbrella, so we just got hooked up um, via that." And then he was on uh, Warp Tour 2018 as well for a little bit. Um, so yeah, we like kicked it a couple times, and um, yeah, just kind of went from there. Did you work on the song that came out today? As we I did, did. Nice. yeah. The uh, it's him and Jelly Roll together. Yep, dude, it's it's so cool. I think uh, I love. I mean, those are my two favorite types of music, and in, in one thing, like country and mm -hmm. and metal and rock are like all that I listen to and all I enjoy doing. Um, so yeah, to to be a to, I'm gonna say a small part of that um, is uh, was really cool. So and I didn't even know it was coming out. So I like was driving home today from working out this morning, and I. Heard it on the radio, and I was like, I didn't know this was coming out today. Did it leak? <laughs> <laughs> and then I noticed all it was up and everything. Yeah, it's funny because, I, like I said, I drove down this morning, and I, as I was driving, I looked, my email popped up, and it's just like, falling in reverse with Jelly Roll. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, it's it's wild, down, man. It, you seen the video? Yeah, yeah. The I video watched. was crazy, dude. <laughs> well, I guess, did you write the like the heavy, heavy part for Corey Taylor? For the when the uh, for drugs? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't even remember how the riff goes at this point, but uh, yeah, for on drugs, it was just that um, breakdown by everybody. It's like everybody is. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it was. I just wrote that. Oh, part. nice. We'll talk a little bit about the country side of you too, because I mean, obviously, you're 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 writing country songs too. Um, mm -hmm. How what what's that world like? Because I mean, obviously, yeah, mo most guests on the show are not in the country world. Sure. Um, I grew up. Like I said, I grew up here. Right. Grew up around a ton of, uh, you know, everybody's dad played guitar for somebody, you know, oh, yeah. at some point, you know. Yep. So, uh, what's what's kind of that that whole that whole world like for you? So I moved to Nashville in 2018 to like write country. Uh, it kind of fell out of nowhere. I was raised around it. Absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, I'm from like the sticks in Florida, like, you know, small town county fairs, like all all that stuff. Like it was just country music everywhere, and I hated it. And, um, you know, I was at the, I was at the time I was like super into like, if there's no riffs, I don't want it. If there's no right. breakdowns, I don't want it. If there's no screaming. I don't want it. Uh, and I think it was like our first tour ever. I was still pretty like gung ho on heavy music. And I remember one night I, uh, you know, we we're hopping in the van to drive to the next show. And I was like, dude, I just, I want to listen to anything other than just getting my head kicked in. <laughs> and I was the one that had to drive. And so I was like, you know what? Let's just see what this is all about. I think I popped on like Florida Georgia Line or something like that. Uh, and I found myself really enjoying and like starting to like almost dissect um, like what's going on songwriting there. And I think that's been a really big part for me um, of like learning how good songs are written 
because uh, I think country music has the best songs, um, just bar none. Um, I think the storytelling is amazing. Um, obviously, it's di- when you when we talk about songwriting, you know that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. That can be the technicality of the riff, or how catchy it is, or how hard it hits you, or stuff like that. But I think for me, at the core of like a song being, you know, a way to tell a story, I think country music has that completely unlocked. Um, so yeah, I started listening to that and like picking up on um, cues on like, oh, well, this is how like this is how a hook feels. Like, why why does this feel so good when this chorus drops? And then you're like looking at different things and like studying how it's done. And so that kind of like really incited like taking songwriting further than just being like the riff guy or just being the guy that's writing wage war songs. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where it started. And that was probably 2015. And so I kept, you know, getting more into it and like feeling that burn. And so I finally was like, you know what? I moved to Nashville. I want to be a songwriter. Um, you know, most people in bands, even up to like levels that we're at still have like side hustles. You know what I mean? Um, and so for me, I was like, well, if I'm not on the road, I want to be writing songs. I feel like these are the only two things that I'm good at and I want it to be my plan A. Um, no plan B, just this is what I'm doing and this is how I'm going to do it. I moved here. I forced myself to do it. Um, so that was 2018. Um, you know, I've started very, very low on the totem pole here. Um, and just kind of started getting in rights that I could, whether I was useful or not, or just trying to be a sponge in any room I could get in, uh, in 2020, I believe, uh, I signed a publishing deal. Um, which that has been uh, with BMG, which has been really helpful for me as they kind of like can place me in certain spots and um, put me in um, interesting rooms. So for me, like the first like real um, country thing I did is this band called Lakeview. Uh, and they're this, uh, they started more on like the country side of things, uh, but now they're doing this really cool like rock country yeah, they're blend. Kinda, they're kind of popping off. In yeah. That, in that kind of crossover. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And I've known Jesse, uh, which is the the main uh, singer. I've known Jesse since I was like 14 playing in bands. Or not 14, like 16 or 17. Uh, playing back in bands in Florida. He used to be in a band called Von Wolf. So he was playing with like really early iterations of like Wage War. Uh, and he was always in like the cool band. They were like, every time I die chaotic, like they would show up to the show and like throw drum sets in the crowd. <laughs> and we're like showing up with like, you know, our like backing tracks on an iPod, like our intro yeah, and everything's yeah. on there. And so we're like this like super standard metal core. And then they come in here with like, it's loud, it's live amps, it's all this <laughs> stuff. So they were always the cool band. And then, um, they moved here right about the time I did. And then, uh, Luke, who used to be in those who fear, which was a face down band, uh, got to know him and uh yeah so we just kind of started writing together because like hey we should just like see what happens and like the first stuff we wrote was very like i'll say like more or less like florida georgia line-esque like down the middle pop country thing and then i think we all i say we they uh you know started like kind of leaning into this like hard rock vibe with country and i feel like rock is not only doing great in country but kind of all over the place again um and they are really i feel like making their mark right now we did home team uh which did really well for them and then they just dropped uh money where your mouth is which i feel like is crushing right now but is that the one with gideon in it yeah 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 yeah. yeah. that's that's wild (laughs) yeah it's it is a wild ride man um but yeah so that's kind of where my country thing started um you know i've been fortunate to work in or fortunate to work with hardy um on radio song which i got brought into by jeremy uh from a data member so that was a great thing for me and then uh i got hit up or hardy hit me up to do jim bob which just came out last week which is the same kind of thing it's just like i feel like it's just my signature move i'm just like the riff guy you know what i mean like <laughs> i need a riff yeah exactly oh, which I'm, I'm honored to be that guy yeah. i really am so um through that i've also um been doing a lot more like producing i've got some songs coming out with other artists that aren't um, announced yet that maybe like shoot a little bit straighter down like the country thing, but I love it, man. And I I love, um, I love like blending the two worlds. And I think what, what I have to offer is maybe a unique perspective in a country room here uh, just because of what I do. And the cool thing about Nashville is everyone thinks it's cool. Like, I think it's cool when people are in country bands and people think it's cool that I'm in a, a metal band. So <laughs> right. it's like, we're both just like, dude, I wish I could do what you do. You know what I mean? So. I just want to, I just want to throw down sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes like, ah, sometimes I just want to play acoustic and cry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> some of the best shows I've seen, like, I mean, obviously 
you know, Garth Brooks was, oh, yeah. was a wild show. Dude. Like it, it felt like I it honestly felt like I was in someone's living room. Yeah. And their uncle played guitar and it just, it was just a wild show. That's his like, thing, dude. Awesome, is like man. connecting with like, even like the nosebleeds. Yeah. Like if you're in the back, you're still feeling the show. Like that's, that is exactly how you do performances. And Garth was that for yeah. sure. And then Save Me by Jelly Roll. Mm hmm. Like as soon as I heard it, I was like, "This is a hit," you know. Oh, yeah. Like I'm saying, like I love this song. Like there's just the whole, just the the lyrics and you know his singing and everything about it just like hit me. Like it was yeah. like a perfect storm. And then, you know, my wife and I are, are doing media at Louder Than Life. He's playing Louder Than Life. They're playing Save Me, and I am in the crowd, tears just just weeping down <laughs> yeah. my face. And my wife. Who's you know a bit of a a, a hard ass? She's like, are you crying? And I'm like, no. <laughs> it's know? hot. I'm and sweating. I, I got my I know I got my sunglasses on, but I mean, just tears are, are coming out from behind yeah. them because it's just such a such a heartfelt song. And so it's when, great. when yeah. and that's something that as much as I love a great riff, obviously the new age war stuff is fucking murderous. Thank but, you. But <laughs> you know the the a song that'll just tear your soul apart too. It'll get you. Hundred percent going. Yeah, I love that's what that's what I think I love about country the most. It's like I I love sad, feely music. Um, so getting those songs that feel like they're just finding you right where you're at is like the best thing for me. Was it tough to kind of get in those songwriting rooms where they guarded and sheltered and like don't want to let anybody in? Yeah, and I, I think I, I definitely wouldn't say that I'm like exactly where I want to be. Like I have a long way to go. Um, and I I feel the same way about songwriting right now as I do. Or, and I still feel this way about Wage War, but as I did, like, when I was touring in a van with Wage War, where I was just like, we're doing this, I don't care, like, from the, like, let's grind, let's do all the tours, let's, you know, oh, you're going to lose money if you go to Europe, it's like, all right, well, we got to go to Europe, so we're going to do it, you know what I mean? I think I feel the same way about songwriting and producing that way as I do now, where I'm just hungry, like, I want to get out there and do it, because I think, ultimately, that is my favorite part of music, is, like, songwriting. Um, and playing live is great and that's an irreplaceable, fe uh, irreplaceable feeling, but being able to that, like Eureka moment of like being in a room with people and like listening back to something and being like, we got them, you know what I mean? Like that, that is my favorite part of music. With your publishing deal and whatnot, are you, are you demoing things and sending them on and then they can kind of pick and choose or are you like, is it more of a writer's room kind of? Yeah, uh, it's, it's mostly artist rights. Like sometimes I'll do like a pitch thing or, you know. Uh, submit something for something but i pretty much always am doing an artist and maybe like one other person um and then just whatever role needs to be filled that day i'm like kind of tried to swiss army myself to be like there's usually a track guy a top line guy and a lyric guy they can all kind of do uh different things or um everyone can give input everywhere but for me i'm just whatever you need today is what i'll do <laughs> yeah all right let's go back to ocala florida man um okay Young Cody, what's what's what <clears throat> sparked the music interest in you? Uh, my mom and dad are both career musicians uh, and have been since I was born. Uh, my dad, or both my parents, used to work at Disney uh, in like the music part of it. Um, all growing up, um, and then my dad uh, was in the CCM world, um, and he used to tour with a band called For Him. He played bass for them as well. Um, so he was like the touring guy and, you know, he would bring us out to shows and we get to see him and, you know, see the backstage experience, like which just is the most intoxicating thing as a kid to like get that experience. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what I was looking at, but I just knew that I, I loved it and I wanted to do it. Um, and then the same thing with my mom. Like we would go see my mom sing. She used to sing uh, at a, I think it was like a country bar in, a Hyatt called the White Horse, so we would go see her sing there, and she did jazz stuff too. My mom's got a, a beautiful voice, um, and my dad is the best bass player I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, so from a very young age, like loved music, um, and then I think I was eleven, and I couldn't stick with anything. I just was like going through hobbies, you know, so fast. I was like, I really want a guitar, and they're like. We'll see if you still want a guitar in like a couple months or whatever. And I kept, you know, incessantly being like, I would, I want this, I want this. So, got my guitar at eleven, uh, and just pretty much kept, just kept going at it. And um, my brother played drums as well. Um, you know, grew up like playing in church, stuff like that. And that's where I like got to like feel like the onstage thing for the first time. Um, and then yeah, got into local bands. 
did the whole circuit of you know playing VFW halls, any churches that would take metal music. Uh, we played an RV park, you know, just did <laughs> did the whole thing. But yeah, I mean, I think for me, like my parents are are for sure my nice. inspirations for that. First riff you learned. Uh. I want to say it's either Sweet Home Alabama or uh, Growing Up by Blink-182, I think, which are very opposite ends of the spectrum. But <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Um, getting into, like, local bands and kind of getting – Ocala is very close to Orlando, correct? Yeah, an hour and a half-ish. Okay, yeah. so that, I've always – Close kinda, enough. I've always kind of put them together. So, so, I mean, obviously, if you're playing locally in the Orlando-Ocala area – is it is it is it tough for a scene to be there because it's such a destination vacation town? Yeah, like we don't get shows. Like you wouldn't get like tours wouldn't make stops in there because it's probably like a C or a D market if that. Um, it's piping up now because we've got the World Equestrian Center there, which is basically where all the rich people go to show their horses. Nice. Um, so we've had like like it's mainly country that comes through there. Um, but I mean, the local scene was always really strong there because, you know, we had a, you know, data member, uh, under oath was there as they were coming up. Um, there's a couple other bands that would like kind of go through there. Um, and there's obviously all the like local legends stuff that we grew up around, but I feel like it's almost this, um, it's like something in the water vibes where, yeah. you know, if seeing someone do something so great from your small town kind of like fires everybody up because it's like well why not me you know yeah. I mean? like like why can't i do that so um yeah i feel like there's always been a lot of I, I haven't been back in a while admittedly to really dive into that side of ocala but I, I know there's a couple bands that are you know still buzzing around and um you know we've we put uh, there's a band called scattershot um that we had on our show two years ago in ocala i think or in orlando we try to like pay back that yeah. um thing like when we get good opportunities and like need bands we try to pull locally when we can but yeah i mean i think people are just you know something in the water maybe is is the best way to say it <laughs> and it's got to be for you kind of growing up with a day to remember being there because a day to remember almost i feel like they almost like the godfather of everything going on right now yeah you know, they, they've kind of got that whole the, the the singing and the heavy and the the you know it was it was like pop punk metal core. It was just mm. everything all together. And it was a fresh take on it at the time, you know? Yeah. And when I first heard it, I was like, Oh, this is awesome. And it's so autobiographical. And, you know, it, it really is, you know, like this is our second album and you know what I'm saying? We, we yeah. signed the record deal three, four, five, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Like it just, they kind of like let you in on the, uh, you know, what's going on at the band at the same time as they're living it, which I always thought was fun. But I mean, I mean, I'm guessing, growing up and seeing a band from your hometown kind of come out and just blow up yeah and and it is the whole like oh well if they could do it i can do it too yeah so it's got that had to have been amazing let alone yeah like holding the status that they hold as as a band um i think four out of five of us in wage war are in a day to remember music videos as fans <laughs> <laughs> like i'm in the downfall video seth is in the um uh what is it Right where you want me to be, like the Christmas song. He's in that video. Chris is in like the City of Ocala video. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was yeah, see, seeing them do that, and they brought us on. Uh, we we did two shows with three actually shows with them in Ocala. Uh, the first one was like while we were making blueprints. We weren't even really a band yet. Um, well, we we were, but we weren't like we hadn't announced a signing or a record or anything. So. We basically played that as a local band at a local bar, O'Malley's. Shout out, Polly. Um, and then in 2012, oh, even before that, 2012, um, they played uh, an uh, ag center in uh, or an ag pavilion, like right up the road from my house. They put us on that. And then when they got the key to the city in Ocala, uh, which was like 7,000 people outside, sick show, they put us on that too, so... Um, yeah, they've been, they've been so good to us and it's, it's cool to see them winning as a band, but also like, they're just such great people and have always been so great to us. So, uh, how old were you when you first started getting into like actually being in bands? Uh, 
seven. I think I played my first talent show in seventh grade, maybe. Um, I think that's correct. Yeah, first talent show in like seventh grade, and then 14, 15, whatever era of life that is, was like my first <laughs> battle of bands. Actually, with my best friend I was just talking about, he was in there, and his twin brother lives here as well. But we won like a battle of the bands locally. Um, and we were like, we basically just sounded like Bullet Front Valentine. That's what we were going for at the time. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, yeah, we, uh, that was my first like, band experience and then we kind of changed our lineup around a little bit and it all kind of started in that same band and the members have kind of revolved into different uh different iterations that ultimately landed in wage war but it basically started with uh with the core for sure is trivium an orlando band they are okay were they anything you looked up to growing up definitely um i think at the time like ascendancy uh well, that was like right when I started getting into like metalcore. I was really into Azalea Dying and Kill Switch Engage and stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, Ascendancy and the the Crusade, um, I thought was so sick. Um, I know our drummer really loves that one as well. But yeah, maybe not. Uh, maybe not as much. But yeah, I definitely love Trivium for sure. When you first start getting on stage, getting the crowd response, things like that, what, was it just intoxicating back then too? And like you're like, yes, I wanted like this is what I want to do. Yeah, I, I feel like the stresses remain, but they're just different. You know what I mean? Um, I think back in the day, you know, you're thinking about, I hope my amp works. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I or, I hope I don't break a string because this is the only pair of strings I have this month. You know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, that, that feeling of, like, getting on stage and starting and obviously gauging your band in the local scene was like, well, how big was the mosh pit? You know what I mean? It's right. like... If it went crazy, your <laughs> band's huge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I remember uh, our first, like, big headlining show was, like, 450 people in our hometown. That was, like, we were in high school at the time, and that was, like, we did it. You know what I mean? Uh, we had – we rigged up um, Cold Sparks to hit on a breakdown. We were, it, was like a, it was, like, a concussion flashbang, basically. Yeah. Uh, so the breakdown hit, and it was, like – this really loud bang and it was like it, it sounds like corny production but it was so sick as far as like the local scene went but um yeah i mean i i think i think that's the most addicting part about playing live because why else would anyone volunteer to leave their house for months and months and months and be on planes hotels vans buses <laughs> like that that 45 to hour and a half is truly one of the most amazing feelings of all time. And that is why people choose that life as hard as it is. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. When does wage war come together? Uh, 2010 was like the kickoff is what I would say. Um, me and Seth, uh, our other guitar player, um, had like basically, um, carried over from a previous band um and we had britain was in our local scene too our vocalist um we were like dude we were like, like kind of rebranding like doing this whole thing um we gotta have britain like he's insane we gotta have him so we recruited britain had a different drummer different bass player and we were playing shows uh you know a couple revolving door things it was like right at the time in life where it's like all right, do you want to be poor for a few years and see if we can make it as a band? Or do you want to immediately go to college and do do the college thing, which obviously um, is a great option as well. Um, still friends with our previous members, like talk to them all the time. And um, yeah, so 2010 and then 2013 is when we got this lineup together. Uh, we found Chris through a friend and Chris was from like a pop punk band. He was like, I think more than anything, he was interested in playing music more than he was playing metal music. Um, but he's been such a wonderful addition to the three of us. And then Steven did, uh, submitted a YouTube audition, and that's how we got Steve. What was the first big tour you guys went on that you were like, holy shit, like the, this, this band is taking us out? Uh, August Burns Red, we were one of five. <laughs> one of five on like basically a House of Blues tour which was, you know, great at the time. Yeah. I think we were making 
a hundred bucks a night, maybe, wow. maybe a hundred fifty. It was a lot. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We were. Uh, it was crazy, and um, we had done. Ice Nine Kills had just signed to um, Fearless. They had been on the imprint for a long time, Outer Loop, and so they just became a full fledged Fearless band. So our first tour was actually Ice Nine, us, uh, a band called My Enemies and I, and then uh, a band called The White Noise, which are both fearless bands that i don't think are fearless or that i don't think are bands anymore but it's called the fresh faces tour so it's basically here's the fearless here's the new fearless catalog right go check them out and i think between ice nine kills and us like we weren't drawing more than like the biggest show was like 300 people which is crazy to think about now right um especially considering how massive the they have become um so yeah that kind of and actually coincided with the august friends red tour we had two days off in between which we didn't even go home so from october it was october 9th until december 20th we were on the road uh but i remember getting the august friends red email and we all like immediately i don't think they had facetime rocking yet then so we were like you know doing the phone tag thing right. with everybody and we we're like dude did you see the email we just got off of august friends red we played 25 minutes it was six songs best time ever <laughs> gotta be lo- gotta love being first of five yeah and it was i mean it was us or it was ours friends red every time i die which yeah amazing uh stick to your guns and polyphia in us oh wow so it was a real uh real diverse lineup yeah it's what that sounds like one of those bills where people are like dude i saw a wage war yeah in for you know polyphia it's and, crazy and you know looking back on it it's like one of those wild like you know, I saw Mike Chemical Romance open for Story of the Year. You yeah, know? like yeah, like one of those nights where you can, like, yeah, I saw that. What do you, you know? What do you, what do you got? Yeah. <laughs> when, when did you realize that Wage War was like, kind of taking off or like, digging in? It's hard to say. Like, we just worked so hard for so long, um, like, head down and like didn't really have a gauge. We got a lot of tour offers, but sometimes I didn't even know if we were taking them because they were good offers or if they were like tour offers. You know what right. I mean? Um, and I'm not saying that in a, because of the bands we tour, I think I'm just saying like, is this monetarily acceptable for what we're doing? You know what I mean? Or, or, you know, is this, is this furthering our career? Um, so I would say like Warp Tour 2016 was great. Um, we, uh, we got a really lucky break on 2016. We were supposed to be on the full sale stage. Uh, and then we played for that year. They did a live stream announcement for the, um, for the lineup for Warp Tour. So they had a live event at Full Sail. We were like one of three bands that were asked to play it. Um, and so I think so- sometime during that thing, we said hey to Kevin uh, Lyman, the uh, owner of the festival, and I think his wife was with him or something. And uh, we met them and you know, we're just talking to them. And we played, and apparently after that, this is the story that I've heard. Uh, apparently she was like, and we're babies at that point. We're like 21, 22. She's like, those boys are so nice. Like, you should bump them up a stage. So we got bumped up the oh, entire wow. tour. We got put on the monster stage, which that was the year that they made them the same size as the main stage. And it was like Red Dawn and Blue Mutant or something like that. Um, so, yeah, we got we were supposed to play the little build it yourself stage on Warp Tour in 2016. But we got, you know, we got to be on the big boy stage. And I feel like that was a very early like big jump for us because we got in front of more people um we also did that one in a van which was horrific uh and then i think 2018 when we came back to warp tour i feel like we were at least one of the heavy hitters uh on our side of on our side of the world over there so i think that was maybe the first time i was looking out and, and being like oh we're, it's working. <laughs> this thing we're doing. Is yeah, this thing we're doing is, is actually making sense. Obviously, what came when you came onto my radar was the Johnny Cash song. Yeah. Obviously, you know, growing up in Hendersonville, the home of Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah. I'm like, a heavy band with a Johnny Cash song? Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, I got to check this out. And it all kind of came together. For me, throwing out those, those softer vocals and things like that mm-hmm. at the time, were you guys worried about kind of going a little bit lighter? or, or you 100%. Know, or, yeah. Okay. That record had Gravity... And Johnny Cash on it. There's there's singing all over Blueprints still, but that was like, oh, we have like clean tones now on right. a couple of our records. Um, yeah, so it was definitely like, and I guess it, it it's 
different for every genre, right? Like for metal, it's like, you know, this isn't real metal because they're singing in it. Or if you go more singing, it's not metal anymore. For country, it's like, this is too pop. It's not real country because you've got guys like, you know, Zach Bryan and stuff like that that are doing this like really acoustic, like almost folk yeah. Americana style stuff. And that's like what is like the new, like this is country now. Like you don't hear a whole lot of the early, you know, 2010s kind of country anymore. Like Chris Stapleton, stuff like that. Like exactly. That. Yeah. yeah. Chris Stapleton, stuff like that. Um, so I think every genre probably has its own version of it. Uh, so for us, obviously singing is like the bane of metal at times, you know, or at least the fan base. Cause if there's too much singing, kids are like, mm, not heavy enough. Don't like it, which I guess it is what it is. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's always me melody has always been important to this band since day one. Um, and so I think we've just found different ways to utilize it. And, um, yeah, Johnny cash was one that that was a very personal song for me. And it was, it was at the point, in the record where I was like, I don't care if every single person that likes our band hates this song. It's going on the record. And I, and I, I just like, I don't care. We put it at the end because we were like, if you get all this way to the record, you'll get this one. And it ended up being probably second most, other than Stitch, uh, second most like consumed on the record. And then we put out the stripped version, which did even better than the original song. Um, like numbers wise, streams better. Like we've been closing or faux closing sets with it um and i feel like we just kind of unlocked a moment that locks in for everybody so definitely scary but i think it paid off i guess those could go one of two different ways and i think obviously it went uh the best way for you guys yeah to people really open and i think that you kind of said maybe said it earlier too but i mean a good song is a good song no matter what style it's in right so it, it, and if you know same with jelly roll like obviously his hip-hop passed and then he I had heard of him a ton and I'd actually met him before save me came out. And, yeah. and honestly, like I've talked about this before when I saw him at, uh, he did louder than life one year and he went to the media tent and he did every single sh podcast live show, like anything that was back there. He yeah. was doing it. And he had a bottle of tequila with him <laughs> and he, all, all you had to do to get an interview with him was to do a shot with him. He did a shot with I mean, it was wild. Dude, and, he's a he's a sweetheart, man. Yeah, I I love, I love his character and like what he's putting forth, especially given the success that he's had. You see a lot of people go down a road that kind of sucks, and yeah. then I think for him, he's just like the gratitude and like, um, and just like his whole stance on uh, you know on his life and like what he's been able to accomplish. I think is so powerful and so good. Uh, I mean, for humanity at this point, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, not even just the music space. I think, I think he's doing something really special that hasn't been done, if not ever, in a long time. Yeah, it was wild. We, uh, we, I did an hour over the internet with him. Yeah, you know, just a, just a, a basically a Zoom interview. At the end of the interview, he's like, "Here, here's my number. Let's go to a Titans game together." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "We're best friends now." You know, like, it, yeah. it's just, but it just seems like he's that type of dude that you know, we'll give you the shirt off of his back or, or, yeah. and he, he really does seem to be grateful for everything that he's getting. He's not, I'm supposed to be here. I'm a, you know, I was yeah. born to be this. He's like, he really seems genuinely excited to be, to get everything that he's gotten. Yep. hundred percent. The three songs that are out now, two are fucking punishing. And then the other one is just like <laughs> yeah. sweet as hell, but it's just like, like as soon as tombstone came on, I, I hit it. Obviously, I love riffs. I love the movie Tombstone. Yeah, <laughs> same. So, so, you, so you got like some some good quotes in there. Yep. Um, fucking outro riff on, yeah. that, on that song. <laughs> I've seen so many people like like they do guitar covers, but of just the outro riff. <laughs> I know. I saw that too. I was like, all right, I guess the rest of the song doesn't matter. It's fine. Yeah, and, it, and it's just you know I listened to it again. I was like, God damn, that fucking riff is just it's, it's sick. Like it's. I'm good. That I'm giving that one to Seth. Man, he brought that. Uh, he brought that puppy in. Honestly, we've been sound like faux sound checking with it for almost a year, and um, it was just cool. We call it the Pantera riff. Nice. Okay. Um, so yeah, that he's like kind of started playing it in. Uh, Sound check one day, you know, so, you know the sound guy's like, stage right, and so he would, you know, start playing with, uh, playing that riff, and we were all like, oh, that's pretty cool, and then Steven would like start putting different drums yeah. to it, 
I would like kind of figured it out and we would just kind of like keep messing around with it. Never like actually took it anywhere. And then we got to the end of Tombstone and we knew that we wanted to like throw like the final nail in the coffin. And I think Britain was like, what about Seth's riff that we play in soundtrack? And I was like, let's throw it in there. So we put the movie line in there and then it just drops into that closed hi hat riff, which is like super different for us. But um, I think it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good representation of what I wanted the heavy side of, the album to feel like because i wanted it to feel classic metal and not like right metal core gent metal core you know what i mean mm -hmm. so yeah I mean, maybe that's why i like it so much but yeah. uh, the, uh <laughs> the, the line of you know going all in with a losing hand is just like it's kind of in that save me vibe you know it's like yep. i feel like i i know exactly what that feels like yeah going all, going all in with a losing hand is like the story of my life yeah it's uh it was cool so we watched <laughs> We watched the movie Tombstone um, while we were making the song. I have a monitor, kind of like uh, Maddie has right there. I have a monitor above my like studio monitor, and we did Tombstone in my house. And so we just literally put it on loop like six times, and we were trying to like not necessarily write a song about the movie, right. but write a song with the Im like the imagery. So like losing hand, like gambling, um, you know. Um, all the lyrics are just like basically about smoking a dude outside of a saloon, basically <laughs> like it's this moment is right. what the song is supposed to feel like. But yeah, I mean the, um, the lyrics came out in a, in a really cool way. Uh, and I think it's like a fresh, fresh take, especially for us. Um, not so much a different concept, but definitely a fresh take on, on like how to, how to do lyrics for us. Before the in breakdown, did you guys do other lines like, Oh no! It was be, always it was or your Daisy. If yeah, you do. Daisy. If you do. <laughs> no, dude, it was always ever only gonna be that, dude. I was like, at first, I wanted to like sample the movie. You remember that time in like, oh yeah, hardcore when it was always just like movie quotes right? from like. I was like, well, it seems like that would be a pretty cool thing. Obviously, everything's cyclical in life, so it's like, would this be cool to bring back? And it was like, why don't we just have Britton scream it? And then he did like that's really the first take of it. He did it. He was just like that like desperate like you believe him when he's screaming that you know what i mean it's like same vibes as the movie um but yeah that was uh that was so fun i remember just we were dying in the studio while he was making while we were making it was crazy yeah i, I obviously grew up watching that movie and the, the, the other line that's in the song with the you, are you just gonna stand there, there and bleed, bleed yeah. it's just like in the movie you're just like fuck and that is such a good line you're gonna do something about yeah, it you're just, just gonna stand, stand there and bleed, bleed. Which is a but he's like throw down. Boy. I have I have like multiple uh like pretty much my entire right leg is like tombstone inspired like tattoos and I have say when on the back here. <laughs> I, it's like literally my favorite movie. But yeah, I wanted to incorporate that line without fully stealing the whole thing. Right. Um. But yeah, I uh, dude, I, I love that movie. I can. It, I feel like every time we're in a hotel, it's on too. Right. It's one of those hotel movies. It's like ridiculousness by Rob Deerdeck. <laughs> right. you know, it's yeah, always yeah. on in hotels. But yeah. Yeah, MTV now is just twenty four hours of yeah ridiculousness. <laughs> yeah. So what what's the what's the plan with the new songs that are coming out? Are they leading to an album? Is that where we're going? Yeah, uh, two and a half weeks from now, uh, Stigma comes out June twenty first. Okay. Um, it's ten songs, no ballads, uh, just ten rippers, uh, ten completely different songs. Should I say? Um, we just really wanted to, the basis of the album and the title and like the artwork are all um, the artwork is five nails uh, with a chain surrounding it. This being our fifth record, the song nails is like if there was a title track for the record, that would have been it because it's not songs not called stigma, but it's all about this like concept of furthering like what wage war is in like the music space. I mean the heavy music space, but maybe even further the music space. Um, and like just wanting to do our thing and, and find our thing. And I think, um, you know, we, we started that trail on manic. Um, I feel like we were like finally found our thing to carve. Um, and then I feel like I started hearing all these other bands start doing our thing or I won't call it like specifically our thing, but what I feel like we were kind of running with at the time. I feel like people, like half the bands I hear these days are kind of good taking either taking notes or ripping it off which i mean i'm flattered obviously but you know now that makes me want to go blaze a new trail and like find like what is what is the wage war thing and i think on this record we really uh were able to find that um in the way that we found that is like i said 10 completely different songs picking singles was like a nightmare because it's like well what version of our band do you go with 
which is why when Magnetic came out and people were like, oh, a band's gone soft. It's like, dude, this we've been doing this for five records now. You know we've got songs that aren't just this. Like, just let the song be what it is. And same thing about the heavy stuff. Like, kids have been commenting on the videos like, so is Cody just, like, not singing on this record? And I was like, dude, chill. <laughs> you sing some in Magnetic, though, right? Yeah, I, I, me, that's like 50-50, me and Britain. Right. And then... Cause I, was, I was watching, like a, like, a short clip on YouTube Shorts or... Instagram reel or whatever the other day and like your hair is down and you're singing. I was like, who is this dream boat? <laughs> <laughs> I even showed Melissa, my wife. I was like, this, that's Cody. Like, like, yeah. You know? <laughs> it's all the angles, baby. <laughs> um, another, another thing in, in nails, another line I fucking love is the, you know, white knuckle grip yeah, with an axe to grind. grind. It's yeah. just fuck man. Like, like th this, this might be some, like some quotable shit. Like this is going to be some t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's like probably the, one of the big call out lines on the record. Um, I had in my note section of my phone, I, I keep like an entire note of like song concepts and or even just words that I want to say. Yeah. Uh, and I had white knuckle and axe to grind in there. And at first we were going to call nails axe to grind and we couldn't like find the way to like make it mean what you want it to mean. And then I had white knuckled in there too. just like hanging on for dear life kind of thing. Uh, and then it's funny cause the song is kind of like middle finger vibes to like, uh, people that are just like it's it we didn't plan it this way but it felt like nails was a direct clap back at like negative comments towards like magnetic and, and it's basically just like hopefully not in like a cocky prideful way but in just like a confidence way just being like look we've been doing this for five records like dance on the gray five nails in the casket like you know if you're not in like then get like get what was the chris wrote this press release right and he said uh you're either i don't even know but it was something along <laughs> the lines of like if you're in you're in and if you're not get out dude like right. you don't have to keep you know i if you go to a restaurant and you don't like the food and you leave a, a negative review are you gonna keep going back to it right you know what i mean like if you don't like it you don't like it that's totally fine yeah so i i, I feel like yeah i i feel like with um i feel like nails ended up being indirectly a uh just a shot back at that and then the end of it kind of has tombstone vibes because it's like it kind of it kind of seems like you're talking about killing a guy <laughs> again and i was just like we're like not violent people at all so i don't know why i think angry music just like comes comes across that way but it's like it's basically like if you're ready to go to war let's go they like let's let's dance is basically what that means yeah and i think that if you're, if you're kind of switching it up a little bit and, and kind of you know, reinventing what wage war sounds like or whatnot. When I first heard nails, I was like, all right, good. Kind of got the, 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 you know, the nails in the coffin part kind of yeah. real deep and just like, yeah, know, like I, and then the riff, riff fucking kicks in. And it's just like, the right. idea was that, so manic and stitch are our two biggest heavy songs. So we literally just went <laughs> like, right. it's like, even just like structurally, like starts with like the chorus vocal that keeps going over and over again. Um, you know, this like double drop breakdown at the end. Like they're very like structurally the same. We just use different parts and stuff like that. They're not like carbon copies, but you know, we, we tried to just like, this should be a fan pleaser. You know what I mean? So bringing you back all the way back around to you writing songs with other people and you writing and just kind of being in the world of writing songs. Yeah. When it comes to wage war songs, are you more critical of your songs or are you a little bit more open are you like well that's not how a song is supposed to be written like or how how do you handle writing wage war songs? um i mean there's an element of it that's like this is my baby you know what i mean um but i uh i definitely love input and like collaboration like i've we definitely had some co-writers on this record that can like help pull me out of my box you know what i mean i think everyone i think people win together not not alone you know what i mean um yeah, I mean, I can be both ways about it. Like sometimes, like if I feel like super strong about something, like, uh, like not in like a mean way, but I will like I will force my hand where I have to. Um, if I feel like that, like this is a detrimental decision to a song, um, I think I put an unfair amount of like pressure sometimes on writing for myself, especially when it comes to like choruses, because I was like, well, if this isn't the best chorus I've ever written, then. I don't want it on the record. You know what I mean? I feel that about every single song. Um, so yeah, and, and learning like learning song roles and like different um, how every song doesn't have to be the exact same thing. Like you can change it up. You can do stuff that's like stylistic and you know done. 
it's it's nice when you got all bangers or whatever, but you got to shake it up and do different stuff. And I think that's that's becoming a freeing thing for me. Is like this song is like so weird. Like, is this even us? It's like, well, let's chase it down <laughs> until it is and see what see what we can do with it. You know what I mean? Because last time we did that, it worked. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, doing the song Johnny Cash kind of opened you guys up yep. to we could do whatever we want. So yeah, so stigma out June twenty first. June twenty first. Tours, all that stuff coming up, man. Um, anything else going on we need to know about? Big up to Maddie for letting us be in here. I know this is nice. We uh, I love I love this boy. He's yeah. good. Yeah. That's the one thing, and and we'll end it on this, man. But the one thing that that I love doing the podcast. It took me a long time to really. As much as I love getting, you know, Metallica get you know somebody from Metallica on the podcast. Sure. Like I almost love watching bands become bigger mm-hmm. now, you know, like you, Maddie, like just getting in early and then kind of like watching the bands progress and, and, and opening doors and things like that. So this has been the most fun of fun part of the podcast. I never thought would be something yeah. I would be into. Yeah, dude, it's uh, I, I appreciate you having us and uh, well, me and him. But <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool it i feel like just like anything like you find pieces of things that you you never knew you were going to enjoy when you get in the road you know i mean whether it's like on the road or or doing this or whatever like i feel like it's it's always unsuspecting to see the cool stuff and and this is obviously for us we're just here for the we're along for the ride because we don't know like we could be doing this podcast next year and we could be the biggest band of all time or maybe everyone hates our band i don't know you know what i mean like (laughs) we're all just like buckled up ready for like whatever happens so it's uh it's fun and thank you for caring enough to spend time absolutely well cody man thanks for taking some time here talk to me podcast not fest.com